Good morning from St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where later this morning the funeral service for Lady Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, British Prime Minister from 1979 until 1990, will take place. There have been a considerable number of people here outside St. Paul's. I was just talking to somebody who arrived here at half past three this morning to watch the ceremonial that will take place, and it's not a particularly nice day. It's cold and there's been a bit of drizzle, but we hope the rain will hold off for the processions. It must be said that not since the death of Winston Churchill nearly 50 years ago has the death of a politician been marked on such a scale. It's not quite a state funeral, but nevertheless a very grand affair with full military honours. Lady Thatcher's coffin will be borne on a gun carriage drawn by six black horses of the King's Troop of the Royal Horse Artillery and just that happens just before the entrance to the City of London. And then they come up to the cathedral here at St. Paul's. The streets on the route lined on either side by representatives of the armed forces who fought in the Falklands. Inside St. Paul's, where members of the congregation are already arriving, the doors opened at nine o'clock, apart from Lady Thatcher's immediate family, there'll be a host of people representing bits of her life. There'll be politicians from all political parties. There'll be many visitors or representatives for countries from abroad from the United States, from South Africa, the former President F.W. de Klerk. There'll be a number of famous faces, and then of course there'll be her friends and the people who looked after her in recent years. And also coming to the first politician's funeral since she came to Winston Churchill's funeral, Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. There's a very strong police presence here today. There are policemen everywhere you look in this part of London. Of course, they are no doubt expecting some protests as old adversaries have made their views felt, both in Parliament and in the country at large since Lady Thatcher's death. The battles of the 1980s have been refought, and inevitably questions have been asked about why Lady Thatcher should have been awarded a funeral on this scale where most of her predecessors were buried with modest ceremony. In Whitehall here, there aren't any crowds at the moment, but there's a reason for that, because the journey of the coffin from Westminster to the point at St. Clement Danes, where it's transferred to a gun carriage, is simply by a funeral hearse, so there's not that much for people to see. Nevertheless, the police are very heavily lining each side there. We'll see whether crowds come out. Of course, the justification that's given for this scale of funeral is that Margaret Thatcher was the tiring politician of her generation. The words, actually, of Ed Miliband, the Labour leader. She wasn't only Britain's first woman Prime Minister, she was the first Prime Minister since everyone had the vote to be elected three times running. And she now saw many changes, as we know. Her reforms were bold, painful sometimes, often very bitterly resisted controversial in life she was and still controversial today in death. Lady Thatcher's coffin lay overnight in the chapel of St Mary's Undercroft down there at the Palace of Westminster where of course she fought so many of her political battles and in just under an hour from now it will be brought from there by this hearse along the bottom of Parliament Square into Whitehall and will pass Downing Street number 10, there past the Treasury, and those gates which Margaret Thatcher had installed here because of the constant threat from IRA terrorism. No one will forget her courage when the bomb exploded at the Grand Hotel in Brighton. It was after that these gates were put up for security reasons. And then she goes past the Ministry of Defence on the other side of Whitehall, where the Falklands War, or conflict as it's officially called, was run. And then up to Trafalgar Square, turns right under the observant gaze of Admiral Nelson, and so into the Strand, past Charing Cross, until she arrives at the Royal Air Force Church of St. Clement Danes. And here her coffin's going to be transferred to the gun carriage and accompanied by a band the wonderful sound of muffled drums 
will move at a slow walk down Fleet Street to Ludgate Circus, up Ludgate Hill, to the steps at the west front of St. Paul's Cathedral. Now we have two reporters with us this morning watching events out there in the streets. Michelle Hussein is going to be at St. Clement Danes and Sophie Rayworth is at the Palace of Westminster. Well, it is incredibly quiet here at Westminster at the moment, eerily so. In fact, just a handful of people waiting by the barriers for the moment when Baroness Thatcher's coffin leaves here for the last time at 10 o'clock this morning. The hearse carrying Baroness Thatcher's body arrived here just yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock, the coffin draped in a union flag. It was a low-key arrival for the woman who dominated Parliament for so many years. Her body was carried down some steps into the chapel of St. Mary Undercroft, a small, gothic, beautiful chapel that dates back to the 14th century. And there her coffin rested overnight, beloved mother, always in our hearts. The message from her children, her twins, Mark and Carol Thatcher, who came here yesterday afternoon for a short service in the chapel led by the Dean of Westminster. It was attended by around 100 MPs, peers and staff from Parliament and Downing Street. And then until nine o'clock last night the chapel remained open so that more MPs and peers as well as parliamentary staff could come and pay their last respects. Well it was Margaret Thatcher's wish that she should spend her last night here before her funeral at the Palace of Westminster as close to the House of Commons as she could be. And at ten o'clock this morning she will leave here for the last time. She will be driven in the hearse to the Strand and that's where my colleague Michelle Hussein is now. St. Clement Danes is the church of the Royal Air Force, but today it has a unique role to play because it is here that the undertakers will hand over to the armed forces and the coffin will continue its journey as part of a ceremonial procession. When it arrives here, it will be received by two chaplains, the Reverend David Osborne who is the chaplain of St. Clement Danes and the RAF's chaplain-in-chief, the Venerable Ray Pentland. It'll be placed on stands that are already waiting in the nave and both chaplains will say prayers during the brief time that the coffin is here inside the church. It is after those prayers that the bearer party will approach. This is a group of ten men who have been chosen from across the armed services and who together represent regiments, units and ships that all served in the Falklands. Among them the Scots Guards, the Royal Marines, the Fleet Air Arm and the RAF. And leading that bearer party will be two brothers who are Falklands veterans. Uh, Major Nicholas Mott of the Welsh Guards, Garrison Sergeant Major William Mott. In 1982 they were both on board the Sir Galahad when it was attacked by Argentine forces and suffered terrible losses. Today, they will be part of that bearer party that will carry the coffin out here to the gun carriage that will by then be waiting. And then, once the coffin is placed upon it, they will walk alongside the gun carriage all the way to St. Paul's Cathedral. Michelle, thanks very much indeed. Well, the doors of the cathedral behind me here opened at 9 o'clock exactly. There was a queue already of people waiting, the umbrellas up because the rain had just started. Uh, and people inside are looking for their seats. Uh, many of the more prominent guests are placed, others are fighting to get a seat where they can properly see and hear. And during this time the organ will start playing from now until the beginning of the service. All the music chosen by Lady Thatcher, all apart from one piece by Charles Stanford, who was Irish, by English composers. And indeed there is an Englishness about this service that you will recognize as it uh, as it takes place. Now under the great dome designed by Sir Christopher Wren, 365 feet high, is the place where Lady Thatcher's coffin will rest. And just near there, two small thrones for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And then beside them, the Prime Minister, former Prime Ministers, members of the Cabinet, members of the Armed Forces, the Knights of the Garter, many foreign representatives from nearly 200 countries, including American Secretaries of State, George Schultz, James Baker, Henry Kissinger's coming. Uh, we did think that Hillary Clinton might be here, but we gather she's not. And then, of course, Lady Thatcher's family and some very close friends and people who looked after her. 
Uh, her two grandchildren, Amanda and Michael, are going to be in the procession carrying her Order of Merit and her Order of the Garter. And her granddaughter is going to read one of the lessons. The other read by the Prime Minister. Lady Thatcher had said whoever was Prime Minister at the time, she would like it read by him or I suppose her. There will be beautifully sung music from the choir of St. Paul's. There will be bold and stirring hymns for the congregation to join in. The Bishop of London will give an address. The new Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will give the blessing, his first state occasion since his appointment. And the coffin will then be taken back from here to the Royal Hospital Chelsea before going on to the crematorium and her ashes will be buried tomorrow in Chelsea near the ashes of her husband, Sir Dennis. And just before we leave the cathedral for a moment, I should just say, if you don't want to watch the procession to St. Paul's and all the other events unfolding, but just want to see what's going on inside the cathedral without commentary, you can do so by pushing the red button and we'll say goodbye to you. But for everybody else, here we are in the studio in front of St. Paul's, and I have with me three guests. Shirley Williams, former leader of the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, former Labour uh, Minister, yes. uh, Peter Hennessy, Professor of Contemporary History and for many years a political journalist, and Sir Terry Wogan. Lovely to see you here, Thank Terry. You, David. So let us start with you. What, what brings you here? Well, I, I represent the hobbledehoy element that have been invited. The hobbledehoy to Irish element. You well, well, no, not necessarily <laughs> Irish, but, but just, you know, the players, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm representing those. and. Uh, privilege to be here. Of Seriously, course. what brings you here? What is it? What was it about uh, Lady Thatcher that? that uh, well, I can't claim. I can't here? claim that I I knew her intimately, but I did interview her when uh, a long lost television show called Wogan. She came on, and uh, conducted herself with great propriety, and in fact. Um, Afterwards, in the hospitality suite, which we used to call hostility, she brought Dennis with her, and Dennis was, was downing the pink gins, as was his wont, and he'd had at least three or four, <laughs> and, and she it was keeping a, a weather eye on him, and she said, um, Ah, Dennis, that's two you've had. We must be off. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's how I knew her, and, and she invited us when I was president of the Lord's Taverners Charity for Handicapped Children. And she was good at that, wasn't she? I, she came to, to a charity that, that I was president of, and out of the blue, I'd asked her again and again if she was free, and one day suddenly Bernard Ingham rang up and said, I should come. Am I and, she, and she made a terrific yeah. speech, you know, and stayed an hour and talked about, okay. I talked for, to everybody who was I'll there. I'll not forget her for turning up for children in need, the only, yes. the only prime yes. minister to do so. Shirley, this, um, this business of... Her husband, Sir Dennis, is obviously very, very close to her. But let's just look at her as a woman politician. I mean, you are a woman politician. You know what it's like in the House of Commons and indeed in the House of Lords. What was it about her that um, was so striking? Well, two things, really. I mean, the first was that, that her domestic life was a very precious separate thing. I mean, I remember that on at least three occasions when I met and talked to Margaret, she was ironing at the same time. She was very keen on ironing. It was somehow something about the tidiness and sort of correctness of, of her life um, and I think Dennis Thatcher was crucial to that but in a funny way I also think he wasn't particularly interested in her politics and her policies he was particularly interested in her he loved to watch her act in the political world yeah, when, 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 she, when, she told, when she told him she was standing for leader for leader he said of what <laughs> he said of what that, I think I started that story yes. and it's a true it's story, true story is it? true story I and think he must have been teasing her. well I'm not sure entirely I think he actually kept a certain detachment he kept himself as her husband and she always regarded him that way she was very proud of making him breakfast quite often mm. as well as ironing the shirts what about in the House of Commons what well then take the other why side we're here her. I suppose right. is that the real question first of all because of the extraordinary single-mindedness of her personality. I mean, what really zoomed her from Grantham to number 10 was this extraordinary commitment of the whole of her energy and thought to how, to, how she was, where she was getting and how she was going to get there. And it, that went through the whole of her political life, staggeringly much more than, I think, any other Prime Minister. And secondly, something that hasn't been talked about a lot, which is that Margaret Thatcher saw politics as being extremely serious. It wasn't the subject of cartoons, it wasn't the subject of jokes, it was something that was of central significance. And therefore, 
unlike many male politicians, who she regarded as playing games. She never played games with politics. She was always central and serious. It wasn't politics for gossip. Peter, there hasn't been a, a, a funeral on this scale since Winston Churchill. Since I 1965. Suppose, uh, yes, and before that, you know, you have to go to Gladstone and Palmerston. And Wellington. And Wellington. Wellington. It is, it, they're reserved for the Titanic figures in British politics. And wherever you stand on Mrs. Thatcher and her policies, Margaret Thatcher and her policies, you have to rec recognise this extraordinary force field she had around her. And she had from the very beginning, she was a primary colours politician who spoke in caveat-free sentences. And Shirley and I were talking about her earlier, that no pastel shades, said Shirley. There were no pastel shades. And I was with Shirley, I was very lucky as a young journalist, in the first weeks of 75, when it, Shirley was a minister, and the private secretary was going to bring in the news of who'd won the... The, the last runoff ballot, Willie Whitelaw or, or Margaret Thatcher, to lead the Conservative Party. And I remember Shirley saying to me, before the result came in, as a woman, I hope it will be Margaret, but as a Labour politician, I hope it will be Willie, because if it is Margaret, she will polarise politics and she'll push my party to the left, and Willie Whitelaw won't. And Shirley, you were spot on, and that's partly the big story of the 1980s, a primary colours politician who disturbed all the atoms in the normal force field of British politics. We'll talk, we'll talk more about it uh, during the morning. Let's just uh, have a reminder, though, about, uh, about Lady Thatcher's career. I mean, political careers are always uncertain. Politicians, as Shirley Williams knows well enough, are, are buffeted by fate. And with hindsight, these careers may seem to have a kind of inevitability about them. But for those who chance their luck on a political career, every step may be the one that trips them up. Margaret Thatcher's rise through the Tory ranks to become Prime Minister was no exception. She had the luck, but she also, as Peter was saying, had the, the, the determination and nerve needed to get to the top in a man's world where no woman, remember, had ever ventured before. The incoming Thatcher government tried to curb inflation, increasing tax and interest rates. The economy went into recession, unemployment rose, and with it trade union opposition to her policies. Undaunted by her unpopularity, she pressed on. I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. Thatcher's response to the Argentine invasion of the Falklands 8,000 miles away was decisive but risky. After a victorious 74-day campaign, Mrs. Thatcher celebrated the triumph. Margaret Thatcher returns to Downing Street with the biggest majority since 1945. Her second term of office was marked by violence at home. Violence on the miners' picket lines as they struck against pit closures. Violence in Brighton when the IRA tried to kill her. Life must go on as usual. Thatcher pressed on with plans to hand back power from the state. We conservatives are returning power to the people. That is the way to one nation, one people. On the world stage, she made common cause with President Reagan. We share so many of the same goals and a determination to achieve them. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> but Gorbachev's Russia, too, was sympathetic to her message. It is wonderful to be entrusted with the government of this country, this great country, once again. But her third term in office proved her downfall. An attempt to introduce a universal local tax, the poll tax, led to riots in the streets. And just as damaging was dissent in cabinet over her new stridency on Europe. It led to the resignation of her foreign secretary, Geoffrey Howe, and a challenge to her leadership from Michael Heseltine. When she failed to win an outright majority of Tory MPs, her own cabinet told her it was time to go. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years, and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. One of the curious things about political life is it's those clichés that we see again and again, the picture of Lady Thatcher leaving Downing Street or the, the ladies not for turning, that in the public mind, in our mind, seems to define the politician. In fact, of course, 
Political life isn't like that. As somebody was writing about her the other day, she worked and worked and worked with an attention focus on detail. And those public appearances were just things that were dressed up either for her party conference or for a speech. And it wasn't the real, the real Lady Thatcher. Uh, we're joined now by Michael Forsyth, Lord Forsyth, who was a very junior minister, I think, in, in, her, in her government. But then you got to know her in later years and when she was in the House of Lords. What was your impression of her her strength. Well, actually, I first got to know her with Keith Joseph uh, and, and was involved in her leadership campaign. In fact, I think I won 50 pounds on a 50p stake on her becoming leader of the Conservative Party. 50 pounds yeah, yeah, and 50p? I, I think it was something like Not that. It was, a lot, it was a lot for a student. I mean, she, I got involved because the country then seemed a complete disaster and she, she had this optimism and this belief in Britain and the belief that it could be turned around at a time when most people didn't. And as a minister, of course, you had to work very hard. I mean, David Davis, I remember him shouting to me as I was rushing across the central lobby, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I said, well, Margaret wasn't in charge of that job. And um, <laughs> she expected people to work as hard as she did. And that was quite a, quite a standard. Is it a, is it a, um, a, a, a good and essential characteristic? Because a lot of, a lot of, polit lot of senior pr politicians, a lot of prime ministers aren't like that. I mean, everything you hear about her was focus on this, focus on that, focus on that. Why have you done this? Have you done that? Whereas n you often get a much more relaxed style, don't you, Peter, of a sort of, I mean, the way Macmillan handled Harold the Conservative Party, almost, completely different. Almost took it to a caricature. He was almost prostrate with languor as Prime Minister. And Reading I, was a trollop in the afternoon. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he said, I'm up with a lark and I go to bed with a trollop. That's what he used to say. <laughs> um, but Mar he always felt with Margaret Thatcher that the clock was ticking. It wasn't just that I might not make it through the, f the next election, I might just be a one-term Prime Minister, but even when she was in her pomp in the mid-1980s, as an outside observer of her premiership and her style of government, you felt that the clock was ticking. And she said to a friend of mine in number 10, in July 79, and he said very kindly to her, you've had a very busy year, an exhausting election, I think you need a holiday. But she said, I must govern, I must govern. And she felt right for the very last day, didn't she, Michael, this compulsion to govern? I think, I think she was driven by this thing that she got from her father and her Methodism, that if you had talents, you had to use them, you had to work hard for the benefit of society and the country as a whole. Was it a disadvantage in some ways? I mean, was it that, for instance, that led her to her downfall with the poll tax and her party turning against her because she sort of couldn't see the wood for the trees? Well, I don't know that today's a day to talk about uh, the, the, the politics of it. I, I don't think it was a downfall at all. People think she was very dogmatic, but every meeting on every issue started with one question, which is, what are the facts? She had a, 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 a belief, a set of beliefs and convictions, but she, she was prepared to change according to uh, the arguments. And I think her scientific training made her um, very determined to operate on the basis of facts. And yes. I think modern government, I think, is very difficult for ministers if they're not on top of the detail. Do you agree with that, Shirley? Is that she, she was a mu much more pragmatic politician than people think. She gets called an ideologue. I don't think she was an ideologue. She was a person with very strong convictions. But it's interesting to me that she never, for example, tried to privatise the National Health Service. She never turned back comprehensive schools. And one of the reasons for that was because she deeply believed that what had been embedded in the wishes and opinions of the British people were not for Prime Ministers just to stand on their heads. She was much more pragmatic and much more in tune, I think, with popular opinion than most people have recognised. I, I think the other thing about her is she was always keen, even in her latter years where she was suffering from her illness, she always wanted to get things absolutely right and not let people down. Uh, and so uh, as, as her memory deteriorated, she found it very, very difficult and quite frightening, actually, going to public engagements because there was all this, this worry that she might say the wrong thing. But her sense of duty and being involved in charities okay. and so on drove her yes. on. Let's just go back inside the cathedral where it'll been open now for 40 minutes or so and there are various figures coming up the aisle. Now, we know that there are going to be senior politicians, her cabinet here, and many old friends, Betty Boothroyd there, the former Speaker of the House of Commons. I think Michael Martin, another Speaker, is going to be there too. The present Speaker will be here as well, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, arriving with his wife. The um, inside there on the left, Cecil Parkinson. Leon Britton on the right, both in her cabinet. Ken Clark coming up the stairs, the 
only member of her government who is still in government in the cabinet. And they're going to the, um, the seats that are reserved. The closest part under the dome is where the, the VIPs, so to speak, are going. So Malcolm Rifkind, former Defence Secretary and Secretary of State for Scotland. Vince Cable, the Business Secretary in the Coalition Government. Many Labour MPs have stayed away, but some have come here. It's not been entirely a divided on partisan lines for the reasons we've been discussing. There are some Labour MPs who feel very strongly that they shouldn't come, that it would be hypocritical to come. But there are many others who acknowledge that there is a difference between the person and the politics. And that the politics um, can be set aside for a day like this. Well, all my guests here are going, apart from Peter Hennessy, who's going to stay here, are going into the... You're going, Matthew, into yes, the kid. Yes. Matthew Paris, the former Tory MP, worked very closely with uh, Mrs. Thatcher, and Virginia Bottomley, Lady Bottomley, Baroness Bottomley, Could I should be. call you, Baroness Bottomley, <laughs> who also worked in, uh, in uh, Mrs. Thatcher's government. Uh, Virginia, I'll start with you. What was your, what was your memory of her today when you hear the eulogies and hear the Bishop of London and all that. What's the Mrs. Thatcher or the Lady Thatcher that you remember? Well, she did carve out the way for women. I mean, there were 23 women when I went into the House of Commons. We never thought we'd have a woman Prime Minister, and she was just remarkable. I always think she invented political power dressing. I only got selected in my constituency because I had my hair done exactly like hers, and I wore a suit and a bow like hers. And whenever you saw her, she was sort of impressive, formidable, remarkable. So there was this extraordinary sort of confidence, which I think we've been talking about, came out of being a scientist and being out of a Methodist. She had this sort of clarity. You know, women are always supposed to be full of self-doubt and lacking in confidence. So she had this great vision. And she always knew what the big issue was. I mean, when she said Prague is the centre of Europe, you felt she's right. You know, she brought in Eastern Europe. She recognised that. So she had this wonderful clarity of speech. But to me, I was always daunted by her, I'm afraid. Frightened of her? I'm afraid so. Uh, intimidated. Well, this is what I never realised until much later. She loved a good argument. And she really wanted to give as good as she got. You know. and, but I, of course, was much more intimidated as a junior minister. I remember being summoned when she first offered me a ministerial job. And she said it was an environment. So what did I say? I said, well, Prime Minister, I don't know anything about it. So she said, well, you'll just have to read it up, won't you? And of course, a man would have said, well, Prime Minister, I'll bring a clear mind to the job. So she had this wonderful certainty, um, a wonderful woman, an amazing woman who changed politics for women. Matthew, you, you worked with her as a very young man, didn't you? Writing, answering her letters, writing speeches as well? That's when I knew her advice. best. Yes. I, I was her correspondence clerk when she was leader of the opposition and hadn't been leader of the opposition for all that long. She was a very different person to work for than to work with. I think she could be very difficult to work with, but as a boss she was absolutely marvellous. She was always in at the office before we were. She never left until long after we had gone. Is that marvellous? I thought it would no, it, be it nerve-wracking for you. You can go, I can't go home yet because she's still working. No, she inspired us all with a sense of a kind of mission. It felt, it felt like a, a team, it felt like a platoon, uh, with huge enthusiasm. Uh, we, we adored her, adored her. Did she flirt with you? Because, I mean, most men, I mean, I certainly found when I interviewed her, in many cases, she always uh, just a little bit flirtatious. Nice would, tie, David, where did you get it? That sort of thing, you know. I'll get one for Dennis, I remember saying once. She used to lay her hand on your wrist sometimes. Oh, she never did that. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, was, I wasn't as close to her as you. I don't know whether <laughs> once. And, and uh, I was telling her I was going halfway around the world to see the moon and the stars from the top of some great mountain. And she said, don't bother, dear. She said, uh, you'll go halfway around the world. You'll look at the moon and the stars and you'll think I'm looking at the moon and the stars from halfway around the world. Well, dear, she said, stay here. You can see the moon and the stars from Spalding, she said, holding my wrist. Why Spalding, I often wondered. I have no idea. Lincolnshire. Yeah.
Lincolnshire, yes, of course. Lincolnshire, of course. Lincolnshire. Yes. Near Grantham, yes. yes. uh, where she came from. So just, just uh, uh, we've been talking a bit about the, uh, commi the, the commitment to ideas and the way she handled political ideas. Um, do you think that her, her focus, uh, 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 almost tunnel vision on particular projects and problems, which was her identifying characteristic, did that also allow a big view about Britain and Britain's place in the world? Because the, uh, the, the two things seem in a funny way that they might be in conflict. But the, the, big, they the big view was always there, the big view of Britain and Britain's place in the world, pride in Britain, the belief that we could do it, all that kind of thing. That was absolutely kind of hardwired into her. But what Carol, her daughter, sometimes calls the blinkers, I think sometimes stopped her from seeing the little incidental things going on around the outside and made her curiously vulnerable. Thanks so much. Well, we'll talk a bit more later on, but let's go down to Westminster now, a mile or so away from here, and join Sof Sophie Rayworth again. Sophie. Well, the crowds have grown considerably in the last half hour. A few hundred people now lining the streets, waiting for the moment at 10 o'clock this morning when Baroness Thatcher's body leaves Westminster for the last time. Now, the funeral may be taking place a few miles away from here at St Paul's, but the Palace of Westminster will still play its own role today because for the first time since the funeral of Winston Churchill, Big Ben will be silenced. In fact, we have just heard Big Ben chime for the last time this morning at quarter to ten. We won't hear Big Ben again until one o'clock this afternoon. It was seen as a, a tribute to the late Prime Minister. The only other time that the bells were silent since then was when the clock needed repairs in the 1970s. The Speaker, John Burko, announced the decision this week saying it was the best way to mark the occasion. And he said that he felt a profound dignity and deep respect could be expressed in and through silence. Well, when the coffin leaves here for the last time at 10 o'clock this morning, it's going to be a deeply poignant moment for many people. Margaret Thatcher arrived here as an MP in 1959. She is about to leave here for the last time. She will be driven a short distance, a 15-minute drive to the Strand, and Michelle Hussein is there now. Well, the band of the Royal Marines has just gone past us here, and it is here that the bearer party representing units that fought in the Falklands will take over and the ceremonial procession will begin. And with me, outside St. Clement Danes, is one Falklands veteran, Major General Jonathan Shaw. General, you were a young officer when Mrs. Thatcher made that key speech in Parliament that sent the task force to the South Atlantic. How did you feel listening to her speak that day? Well, it was an extraordinary moment because it came completely out of the blue. We all just gathered uh, around our radio sets and hearing her talk, it was just absolutely spine tingling. Yeah, we realised this was Maggie's call to arms and we had to respond, so it was utterly uh, sensational, really, what she said. And then this long journey began, the journey all the way south to the Falklands. What did the leadership mean to you in those weeks you spent travelling down there? Well, what we've got to recognise is that when we set off, uh, very few of us thought it would actually lead to war. Uh, and it was only when we sailed from the Ascension Iron that we thought, crikey, this is really serious, this is going to happen. And for a young lad like me, I was 24, most of my blokes were younger than me, we'd never been to war before, we'd never been in battle before. And what it meant was having this really steely resolve uh, transmitted over the radio waves. We could hear it on the, on the radio and hear it on the news broadcast. Having that steely resolve behind us gave us just what we needed, just the sort of firm support that we needed. It was really inspirational. And then in the years afterwards, did you ever get to meet her? Uh, yes, I met her a number of times, but the most important one, the six in the brain, is uh, 1997, 15 years on from the, the, the war, when she came to a, a reunion in, in Aldershot for the regiment. And all the protocol just went out the window when she came into the gymnasium because the boys just erupted in spontaneous applause and sustained cheering. Uh, it was just a celebration of the bond between us and her. And today, the bearer party that we'll see here have all been chosen because they represent those who fought in the Falklands. Yes. What does that mean to the veterans? Uh, well, I think, it is, I think it's fantastically emblematic of, of just that bond between the soldiers that fought so hard for her uh, and her. And I think it's a magnificent uh, tribute to them, and I'm very grateful for it happening. Major General Jonathan Shaw, Falklands veteran. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Michelle, Michelle there at uh, St. Clement Danes. And there, just passing out of our picture there, the King's Troop Royal House Artillery, followed by the police. 
if we can see them, you'll see that they're bringing the gun carriage up Whitehall. The streets now on either side closed, the access to them blocked, and these black horses, six of them who will pull the hearse, and the officer's charger in the front, huge horse, called Mr. Twister. They name all their horses after characters from R.C. Surtees' novels. It's called Mr. Twister, but he's called Bert, more informally, when he's in the stables. So that splendid sight of the Royal Horse Artillery, the King's Troop. And they're coming up exactly the same route as the hearse will go, in Trafalgar Square, down the Strand, and to St. Clement Danes. Well, now, uh, here I'm joined by somebody who used to write speeches for Lady Thatcher, Michael Dobbs, who's since, of course, um, written all kinds of books, and in particular, um, the one whose name's escaped me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> A copy will be in the post. I've read them all and I've watched, I've seen the movies. Thank you. Now, just tell, <laughs> I was going to say Queen of Hearts. But <laughs> <laughs> just, just tell me about what it was like writing for her. Writing speeches... And I'll was, say the words House of Cards later on. Oh, thank you very much. That's kind of you. That, that, and writing speeches for her, uh, which I did when she was leader of the opposition, and she was still forming herself, if you like. Uh, she'd come from a Finchley housewife, and she wasn't yet quite the, the Iron Lady. Um, it was an exhausting task. I mean, she, everybody's been saying this morning how focused she was. And she would focus on a speech and go through so many different drafts because she wanted perfection. She wasn't a great orator, but she was a superb speech maker. Uh, and she would work until the very early hours of the morning. I mean, she completely exhausted me, and I'd be trying to stay awake and keep up with her. But you know, we would be sitting there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. She would be in her night clothes, and, and often her Carmen curlers. And, Norman uh, Tebbit just arriving, sorry to interrupt you, ah. at St Paul's Cathedral, who's one of her greatest, staunchest supporters, really, down many years, Absolutely. injured in the bomb blast. That, 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 the the last man in the trench when she, uh, when, when she eventually... Went. And said yep. in, when, in, in the House of Commons uh, that he, there's um, F.W. de Klerk, the former president of South Africa, he said uh, in, in the House of Commons that he felt he'd left her to her friends and they'd betrayed her, didn't he? Yes, oh, the, oh, yes. the only thing he regretted, he said, yes. was to, that he had left her to the mercy of her friends. Yes. Um, I, I was his chief of staff at that time, um, and I believe I was probably the first person after Margaret, uh, Margaret Tebbit that he told that he wasn't going to be uh, putting himself forth for the cabinet after the election, that his, his priority was to take care of his wife, who'd been so cruelly injured in the, in the bombing of the Grand Hotel. It was a terrible difficulty for, for him to confront, but he had to confront it. Uh, what, what, did you, um, what did you mean when you said she wasn't a great orator, but she was a great speechwriter? Do you mean there was, she was strong on content, but not on delivery? Because the uh, things we've seen... <coughs> You turn if you want to, the ladies not for turning, have gone down in history, haven't they, as, uh, as the there, there, there'll, be, there'll be many Tory party faithful who, who disagree with me and say that, you know, that they were enraptured by her speeches. Um, I think that her speeches were better known and better uh, remembered for the content rather than the, the sometimes the, the difficulties she had in delivering them. As a woman, she had so many mountains to climb, and one of those was her voice and her ability to be able to project it in, in, in a way which men would find, with the lower voices, would find much more natural. Matthew? She had the rhetorical power of an electric drill. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was effective, but... Sorry to interrupt you. Ed Miliband <laughs> just there standing ah. outside. We, we're keeping an eye on the people who come. Ed Miliband, leader of the opposition, who'll be sitting in the front row and who spoke about her. Nigel Lawson, who was her Chancellor of the Exchequer. She famously told to, when he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, to get his hair cut. He never did, did he? <laughs> <laughs> ignored, ignored the advice. Nigel Lawson is one of those who resigned, as Geoffrey Howe did as Foreign Secretary. Geoffrey Howe, we think, will be here as well. And behind the beginning of the ranks of the diplomatic corps. Matthew, sorry, go on. Yeah, it was rather difficult to write jokes for her. Uh, she very often didn't get the jokes, and she didn't always deliver them very well. That dead parrot joke, for That's instance, she, you know, she, she'd never seen the Monty Python. <laughs> it was quite... and, and she was never satisfied. Um, she would go on working on her speeches till the very last minute. I remember uh, one occasion where I, I think we were in Scotland. Um, she had actually left 
the hotel to go to the conference hall to make the speech and secretaries were still kneeling on the floor banging away at the typewriter <laughs> finishing off the last few pages i mean it's sometimes it was a very close call yes and she was pacing up and down once ronnie miller was writing a speech for her she was about to make it and he said don't worry prime minister piece of cake prime minister and she said cake ronnie i'm about to make a speech <laughs> <laughs> Is that, yes. No, yes, she, yes. Very good. So, what are the what are the the qualities? I mean, you've you've made a you're living after you left politics by writing about politics. Mm. What are the qualities that make her a politician deserving of what's happening here at St Paul's this morning? Well, it's a very interesting question. I, I do think this will be the last time we see such an occasion. I think from now on in, it will be these sort of occasions will be for uh, senior royals only. Um, there is a real sense of the, the end of an era, not only the, the, the passing of a, a lady, but the end of an era of that type of politics. Chris uh, Batten there, who worked with her to win elections, worked for the Conservative Research Department, is now chairman of the BBC with the spectacles on, his wife behind him. And it's interesting that almost all the men that we have been pointing out here... John, John Major arriving. Another one. She f successor. She, she would have great fallings out with, great rows with, and yet they, they're still coming here to, to do her homage and, and honour. She had a wonderful capacity. Sir John, Sir John Major, for instance, who said her behaviour to him uh, over Europe was intolerable, but actually yeah. was also very generous about her in his... Uh, Yes, and she gave him a very hard time. And Tony Blair, I think, just arriving at the door but, with but Cherie Blair. I wonder what she would make of all this. I, I half can hear her saying, what is all this hoo-ha about? How much did this cost, dear? I could hear her saying. <laughs> yes, she would certainly, yes. certainly worry about that. But yet that. she, she but, uh, yes, it's interesting. She planned the funeral service. The idea that it would be held in St Paul's Cathedral was not hers, is yeah. my information. That came later and perhaps came from St Paul's and she then agreed to it so she was it was the it was the content of the service that mattered to her mm. yeah. and of course the gun carriage and all that all happened subsequently yes. um, interesting it, it is and and if you read the service it's it's very very interesting to to oh well let's just this is the coffin coming out from Westminster now to be taken to the hearse St. Mary Undercroft. Are, are they protesting? These are undertakers from the Leverton family who served the Queen Mother and Princess Diana's funeral. An old family business. It's rather interesting. They were founded in Devon in 1789, the same year as the French Revolution, and they've been undertakers ever since. They're into their ninth generation. And they say, I was talking to them at the rehearsal two days ago, that uh, their part in this is not part at all of the ceremony. Their job is just to move the coffin from here as discreetly and carefully as possible to the church of St. Clement Danes where it will be put on the gun carriage and the formal part of the thing will begin. Down here at Westminster, there is silence. There are no crowds, there's no music, there's the silence from Big Ben because it's coming up to 10 o'clock. Just the chaplains who attend at St. Mary's, the Dean of Westminster Abbey, and one of their members who sat all night with the coffin. Everywhere the body is taken, the uh, place that receives it holds prayers. So the speaker's chaplain, for instance, sat with a coffin all last night down here at Westminster. And in St. Clement Danes, as soon as the coffin is brought in to be prepared for the gun carriage, there'll be more prayers. So wherever 
the body is, prayers are being said. There's a police escort in front, and the police are just starting, and uh, we expect at 10 o'clock, because the bells at St. Paul, or the clock at St. Paul's is still striking, unlike Big Ben, they will set off, and there they go. This whole event has had to be very carefully timed, like all these things, so they leave at exactly the moment they said, at 10 o'clock. No ceremony, just the hearse. Driving away into Parliament Square. It'll go past Winston Churchill's statue. St. Margaret's Westminster, the church on the left there. The white building beyond with the towers, the treasury building with which she did such battle to get control of the economy when she came into office. Always tension between Prime Ministers and Treasury. She's now coming up Whitehall and there are people here, though they'll only see this brief glimpse. Crowds on either side have come out. And there you can see people applauding, indeed hear them applauding. And so far there are no signs of the protests that we'd heard might happen, but it does seem as though, as the police themselves said, there's a lower expectation of trouble than they originally had. There was this event on Saturday at Trafalgar Square when people gathered to protest, but here it seems to be mainly a, a crowd just watching and applauding her as she goes past. Comes past the Women at War Memorial, that black plinth that is put up just beyond the cenotaph for the work of women at war. Perhaps uh, suitable that she who fought the Falklands War against much advice and triumphed in it and should go past that memorial. And the hearse now comes up towards Trafalgar Square. And there it will turn into the Strand and go towards St. Clement Danes. So round under Nelson's column and turning to the right towards the Strand. So this grey day here in London and at St Paul's, the cathedral now filling the Archbishop of Canterbury arriving and John Sentamu, the Archbishop of York the two Archbishops arriving very much unrobed Boris Johnson the Mayor of London there Michael Portillo, who served no government, has left politics now. There are figures from 
her administration. There are people who ran her cabinet office, like Lord Armstrong is here. David Steele, Lord Owen. John Major there talking to the Foreign Secretary, William Hague. Catherine Jenkins, the singer. One of a number of celebrity guests, like Sir Terry Wogan, who was in here, and Tom King, who served as Secretary of State in Northern Ireland, Lord King, as he now is. Michael Heseltine just arriving, coming up the steps. And this is the view from the church of St. Clement Danes. It's here that the real part of the procession or the ceremonial part of the procession begins with the root liners all the way up from here to St. Paul's, made up of the three services and as always in military affairs, starting with the Royal Air Force, then the Army, the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards who fought in the Falklands War, and then finally the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. Street line is now already in place. Nine paces apart, and they were all out here on Monday for the rehearsal. The Church of St. Clement Danes is just there on the right. Often will be met here by the Chaplain in Chief of the Royal Air Force, the Venerable Ray Pentland, and the Reverend David Osborne, who's the resident chaplain here. And the purpose of this part of the ceremony is simply to remove the coffin into the church, await the arrival of the gun carriage of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery and during that period say prayers over the coffin and then the coffin will be brought out put onto the gun carriage and will set off at this slow pace with drums playing and music funeral marches by Beethoven and Mendelssohn and Chopin all the way up and the message from the children still flowers there. Beloved mother always in our minds. Receive the body of our sister Margaret with confidence in God, the giver of life, who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Grant, Lord, that we who are baptized into the death of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, may continually put to death our evil desires and be buried with him.
that through the grave and gate of death we may pass to our joyful resurrection. Through his merits, who died and was buried and rose again for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. God, our Father, by raising Christ, your Son, you destroyed the power of death and opened for us the way of eternal life. As we remember before you this day our sister Margaret, we ask your help for all who shall gather in her memory. Grant us the assurance of your presence and grace by the Spirit you have given us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have not made us for darkness and death, but for life with you forever. Without you we have nothing to hope for, with you we have nothing to fear. Speak to us now your words of eternal life. Lift us from anxiety and guilt to the light and peace of your presence, and set the glory of your love before us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you love everything you have made and judge us with infinite mercy and justice. We rejoice in your promises of pardon, joy and peace to all those who love you. In your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven. Through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died, rose again, and lives forevermore. Amen. Margaret has fallen asleep in the peace of Christ. As we pause here on her journey, we entrust her with faith and hope in everlasting life, to the love and mercy of our Father, and surround her with our love and prayer. God of all consolation, whose Son, Jesus Christ, was moved to tears at the graves of Lazarus, his friend, look with compassion on your children in their loss. Give to our troubled hearts the light of hope and strengthen in us the gift of faith. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, in a moment, the Bearer Party will come and we'll see that and take the coffin. But I've been joined here in the studio by the Prime Minister, David Cameron, who, of course, is responsible for the whole scale of this funeral today. Um, do, do, you, do you understand some people thinking it's a bit over the top? Well, this has been planned very carefully uh, with the family over very many years. There was a plan in place even before I became conservative uh, leader at the end of 2005. I remember being told about the plans and uh, I've always thought that they were fitting. They're in line with what the family wanted, with what Margaret herself I, I no, would I have wanted. Told, I was told that the military side, the bands, all the sort of glorious side that we're seeing was, was your administration's, your doing. Well, no, there was a very clear plan in place. Uh, my input has always been just to, to make sure that it will be fitting and right. I think it is, you know, it is a, a ceremonial funeral, but with many of the aspects of a, a state funeral, and I think that's right. She was our first woman Prime Minister. She served longer than anyone for 150 years in the job, and talking to a lot of the foreign leaders who are coming today, I had some of them to dinner last night in Downing Street, I think people would find it odd if, as a country, we didn't properly commemorate and mark the passing of this extraordinary woman, but I think it's very fitting for someone who made such an impact on our country and on the world. Did you understand why some people can't distinguish the woman, the politician, uh, from the policies and, and, and say this is improper because we're so opposed to the policies. I think, of course, some people will take a different view uh, about uh, what Margaret Thatcher achieved, but I thought the Commons tribute showed that uh, even those who opposed her policies were perfectly capable of saying this was a remarkable woman, a remarkable woman who impacted our history and so therefore it's right uh, to, to mark her passing in this way. And, and just to be clear, I did have conversations, obviously, with the leaders of the Liberal Democrat Party, the leaders of the Labour Party, about the arrangements for the funeral, and they were content uh, with them as well, because I think they recognised, 
spite of the fact they disagreed with much of what she'd done, she was an extraordinary woman and it was right to mark her passing in this way. Did you see there was a, an opinion, I don't like to mention opinion polls on a day like this, there was an opinion poll saying that if the younger Thatcher was now leading the Conservative Party, you'd win the next election and be eight points ahead of where you are now. Well, you, <laughs> it's, it's not the day to talk about opinion polls, and as, 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 as Margaret herself, I'm sure, would have said, there's only one poll that counts, uh, that's the one on polling day. I think I heard her say that a few times, uh, when often in her political life she was, she was further behind the opposition than I am today, so uh, she recognised the circumstances. Do you think, think in a funny way she had an, an easier job because of, what, because of the circumstances of 79, that the kind of zest and the clarity that people have talked about here in the studio was uh, more fitting to those times and that, uh, that politics has become in a sense harder with globalization with pressures on I mean do you feel you can give the same kind of clear focused leadership uh, I think she, she had an incredibly tough time because the circumstances in 79 were very difficult I mean just as when I came to office in 2010 the scale of the deficit that we face the need to turn around the economy some of the circumstances are similar uh, and the courage and resolution she showed is, is necessary again today you get strength from her example oh I learned a huge amount from watching her as a as a teenager in the 1980s, I was speaking about this this morning. I was sort of growing up when the big decisions were made about de de deploying cruise mis missiles near where I lived in, in, in Newbury and the big decisions about trade union reform. They were very formative influences on my sort of growing up and political development. Well, you mustn't stay here too long because you have a lesson to read, a duty to do. Indeed. What will your thoughts be when you're in the cathedral? Um, uh, the, uh, I'm just sort of thinking about it now. I think, obviously, a great pride in all that she achieved, but I think, tinged with a lot of sadness, it's at these sort of occasions that you remember the woman, the person, the, the, the kindness that she showed to people, and I saw that as a junior researcher when I worked for her back in 1988, and I think you'll think of the family and the person as well as the extraordinary things she achieved. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you. Kind of you to come in. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to St. Clement Danes now and see what's going on there. And we're waiting for the arrival of the bearer party. Michelle was saying earlier about these bearer party the troops of the bearer party who come from the Royal Navy, from the Royal Artillery Free. I lead you in hope to the end of your days. And the blessing of Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. St. Clement Danes Church has those, you can't really see them clearly on the floor, slates for various squadrons of the Royal Air Force. This place was completely bombed. It's a Wren church. It was completely destroyed in the Second World War. And it now commemorates the, um, there are the slate, inlaid slates. And all around the walls, there are books. They open their 11th huge volume, which record the name of every airman killed since way back 1912, I think. So they're now standing in silence, and we are awaiting the arrival of the bearer party. I was just saying about the bearer party, in case there isn't time later on. They're from the Welsh Guards play a very big part in this part of the ceremonial. The Garrison Sergeant Major, Bill Mott, we were talking about earlier, a tall, powerful figure who was in the Falklands. And his brother, who's in the Welsh Guards, Major Mott. So the two of them take part in this ceremonial. The gun carriage dates back to the First World War, the gun does rather, from 1914. It's a, a smallish gun, a 13-pounder, because it was used alongside the cavalry, so it had to be light and fast, and normally these guns are seen 
with their horses at full gallop on display in Hyde Park and other displays. But the horses that are pulling the gun carriage today, the six black horses with their riders for each pair, one for each pair, have been trained for the last couple of weeks to take things easy because the last thing they wanted them to go off at a great bolt, they've got to walk steadily. It's very difficult walking at 70 paces a minute for a, for a member of the uh, Guard of Honour, but it's much harder for a horse to keep at that pace and at the same time pull this carriage. There's the wheeler there, the two horses at the back with Lance Bombardier Kershaw, Gunner Hill on the next pair, which are called the centre pair, and then the leaders at the front. The band of the Royal Marines will be leading this procession. Their drums are muffled and draped, and they're under the command of a, another officer who served in the Falklands War, Colonel Hugh Boddington. Colonel Boddington and the two Mock brothers were both aboard, were all three aboard, Sir Galahad, which was sunk in the Falklands, 48 people killed. So this military element is very important and this stress on the Falklands War is clearly a part of the ceremonial we're seeing. Back here at St Paul's, the sand laid out for the gun carriage to arrive. The Prime Minister who was with us a moment ago and his wife are going to take his place. Outside St. Paul's, the a guard of honour of the 1st Battalion of the Welsh Guards, and they will stay here and present arms as various figures arrive, and on either side of the steps there, the Chelsea pensioners. Prime Minister will be sitting beside the Queen at the very front of the congregation. Eric Pickles behind the Prime Minister, immediately behind Prime Minister and his Chancellor of the Exchequer there. Douglas Alexander. President de Klerk once more with his wife on his right there. He's been in London talking about how it was wrong to see Mrs. Thatcher as against apartheid. She was just against sanctions against apartheid. That's the site seen from the top of St. Paul's of the Guard of Honour. The 1st Battalion of the Welsh Guards with the Queen's colour that was presented to them by the Queen just six, four or five years ago. The Chelsea pensioners are lining this route. There are 16 of them. The oldest one, not a man but a woman, they were allowed in a few years back. Dorothy Hughes is 89 years old and he used to meet Lady Thatcher often, she, she used to go down to the Chelsea Hospital. She has a, an infirmary named after her there. She was a great supporter of uh, the Royal Hospital Chelsea and indeed asked for people, if they wanted to commemorate her, to make contributions to it.
Henry Kissinger has arrived. We'd heard he might be coming, former Secretary of State, United States, flew in this morning. The bearer party now in St. Clement Danes coming to take their place beside the coffin. Under the command of Major Mott and with Bill Mott, his brother, the garrison sergeant major, making sure everything works well. This has been very carefully rehearsed. It's not easy. This part perhaps is, except for the fact that they're under the gaze of the world's eyes, this being seen all over the world, is, is not the most difficult. The most difficult is carrying it up the 24 steps at the west door of St. Paul's Cathedral. The coffin is now being lowered to be carried through the west door of the church. This whole operation is much harder than it looks, but it does give a, a solemnity to the event as well. It takes sideways steps, and of course when they're carrying the coffin, they can't go left, right, left, right. You have to move your inside foot and outside, so the orders they get as they do this are inside, outside, inside, outside, rather than left, right, left, right. party are in order of seniority by service and they're also chosen by height so that they very slightly grade the coffin but at the front the Royal Navy and the 40 Commando Royal Marines Corporal Caulfield and Thomas Baker behind them the Royal Engineers and the 4th Regiment of the Royal Artillery Jason Buffum actually comes from Grantham's, Lady Thatcher's home town. And then 3rd Battalion of the Paras and the Scots Guards, the next pair of bearers, Paul Quayle and James Steele. And finally, Tej Poon of the Royal Gurkha Rifles and from the Queen's Colour Squadron of the Royal Air Force, Adam Jones. Thank you. 
party have their hats removed while they're carrying the coffin and there is an order remove hats and to replace hats which they've just done the bearskin and the cap and the Royal Navy hat and the busby of the Royal Horse Artillery distinguished there with the red plume the busby rather than the bearskin The timing of the departure from here is at 10.33 in about 30 seconds. That is so that the journey up to St. Paul's, which goes down Fleet Street to Ludgate Circus and up Ludgate Hill, has been timed at exactly 19 minutes and the coffin will then arrive at the west door of St. Paul's at exactly the right moment. But the setting off is very difficult. They set off and the music is played by the bands as Beethoven's funeral march. There they go. St. Paul's Cathedral at the west door, the Thatcher family arrives. Sir Mark Thatcher there on the right, his wife Sarah, and Michael Thatcher and Amanda Thatcher who will be taking part in the service. And they're greeted by the Lord Mayor of London in those red robes with white ermine on the right there. Sir Mark Thatcher who took his title from his father who was given the baronetcy. And Marco Grass the partner of Carol Thatcher, there with the black hat, Lady Thatcher's daughter.
In the meantime, the procession has been going now for three minutes or so on its way up past it comes into it comes into Fleet Street, goes past the law courts, goes past the bar of the City of London, the entrance to the City of London. St Paul's Cathedral being in the City of London, the Lord Mayor we got a glimpse of there. Uh, will be greeting all the prominent guests and royal guests. Now there may be some shouts as this cortege goes past the narrower parts of Fleet Street. There may be some protests, they're not unexpected. Somebody said that Lady Thatcher herself would be surprised if there weren't protests, because she, she always liked an argument, and even in death, she wouldn't expect people just to come round and to her views and behave as though um, they accepted them. guard of the Royal Air Force on the left there, standing at the present. They actually reverse arms as well as stand at the present as the coffin goes past and look down. There they go back. And this is the arms reverse position. As the coffin goes past, they go into their heads bowed and they remain like that. They don't stay like that for the next 20 minutes. But it's very it's a difficult position to hold. I was talking to one of the officers who had to do this, and it's very easy to lose your orientation and get dizzy when you're looking down at your feet. Very big crowds here. On the way up to St. Paul's, people filling the side streets, hoping to catch a glimpse. And say there was somebody here at 3 o'clock in the morning. And interestingly, quite a lot of people in the crowds. Not people who uh, knew Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister, but have come here to mark this occasion, whether it's this very majestic ceremonial that's attracted them, or the ideas that Margaret Thatcher had, or maybe it's just the notion of being part of a big national event, which everybody's heard about. But at any rate, the crowds are rather larger, I think, than people had expected. Now the route is lined by the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards. So the, this part of the procession, dominated by the Welsh Guards, really. What with Bill Mott, who's the garrison sergeant major, he's in charge of all the ceremonial in London. And then his brother, Major Mott. Behind. and all is going well so far, there have been no disturbances. The crowds on either side have been applauding. Behind another detachment, again, Scotch Guards, Royal Engineers, Royal Artillery, Royal Navy, Welsh Guards, and they're what's called the escort party, who stand and march behind the coffin to close off the, the rear, so to speak, of that procession. The Royal Marine Band from Portsmouth moving seamlessly from one funeral march to another. The Royal Marine Bands were also incidentally in the 40s, so there is 
a pattern and a sense to all the decisions that have been made here. And you can't hear it, but while this procession is going on, every minute a gun is being fired from the Tower of London. Using guns, two of which were actually used in the fort, the ceremonial guns. Those of you who are of a military disposition will know that this is not a slow march as such with a sort of half step, but is marching slowly. And it is very difficult to keep this pace. It's quite a long stride and 70 paces a minute. And it's time to bring the procession to St Paul's at precisely 11 o'clock in about a quarter of an hour. Outside St. Paul's, we're waiting for the imminent arrival of Her Majesty the Queen. The National Anthem plays. The Lord Mayor of London, not the Mayor of London, but the Lord Mayor of London, precedes the Queen holding a special sword called the Morning Sword. Only the second time it's been used in 60 years, it was carried at Sir Winston Churchill's funeral. It's a sword with a black handle and a scabbard of velvet. Majesty of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh coming into this great west door only open for ceremonial occasions giving this wonderful view from the center of the cathedral down the steps into the London scene outside Queen is welcomed by the clergy of St. Paul's and her presence here has been noted. She was a guest at Lady Thatcher's 80th birthday party 
and she herself decided and said to come here, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the last to greet her there. Roger Gifford is the Lord Mayor who will precede the Queen with this procession of the clergy. Takes her up the nave and to the thrones where she'll be sitting. procession led by a verger, the Archbishop's chaplain, carrying the cross of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the chapter, the Chancellor of the Diocese of London, the Bishop of London, who will be giving the address, the Bishop of London there with the white mitre. And then the Lord Mayor, the Duke of Edinburgh on the right, and Her Majesty the Queen on the left there. In the meantime now, ten minutes until this procession with the coffin comes up the Ludgate Hill to St Paul's. This is where famously Duke of Wellington's hearse couldn't get up the hill. The roads were different in those days and the whole thing was held up. Gun carriages pulled by horses are for non-royal non-royal um, processions. The members of the royal family ever since Queen Victoria's funeral, or heads of state I should say, monarchs, are pulled traditionally by the Royal Navy, had to take over when the horses couldn't. There was some trouble apparently coming into Ludgate Circus, just a bit back from where we are now, with some things being thrown at the horses, which has disturbed them. Now the horses are trained for that kind of thing, and over the last weeks or so have been um, put through their paces rather, but if they're tossing their head a little and a little uneasy, it'll be because of that. But the riders with each pair of horses, their job is just to keep them calm and steady and keep them going. We don't know exactly what was thrown or what the noise was down there, but something happened which has slightly disturbed them.
those are not missiles being thrown, but flowers being strewn on the road. And that may frighten the horses just as much as my friend. Remember at Princess Diana's funeral, flowers were thrown at the hearse. And the Royal Marine Band is just coming up towards St Paul's now. The gun carriage is now approaching the west door and the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral where the guard of honour of the Welsh Guards stands facing the cathedral. That face on the right, Queen Anne, the statue of Queen Anne who was sovereign when St. Paul's was completed. of the statue of Queen Anne just in sight there. sound of one half-muffled bell from St. Paul's. The in-pensioners of the Royal Hospital standing at attention. And once again, again the, the key figure in this whole ceremonial, Garrison Sergeant Major Bill Mott giving the orders and the Bear a party for the coffin, hats removed, now very gently lift the coffin off the gun carriage and then we'll carry it up the west steps. And into the cathedral. And there it will be at the end of a procession with the insignia borne by Michael Thatcher and Amanda Thatcher preceding their grandmother. Just final adjustments made to the Union flag draped over the coffin. half-muffled bell rings one loud chime and one softer chime. One side of it is muffled.
So with one minute, the start of the service, with absolute precision, the coffin arrives here in the west door. On the left there, Amanda Thatcher, 19-year-old granddaughter of Baroness Thatcher and Michael Thatcher, her brother, stand with the cushions, which will bear the insignia of the Order of the Garter and the Order of Merit. And they'll be laid on the altar, just in front of the coffin. will stand and as the procession moves through the nave the choir will sing the sentences with music by William Croft sentences that are performed at many funerals and were indeed performed here in St Paul's Cathedral for Lord Nelson's funeral
directly under the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral where it will lie during the service. The bearer party leave and in a moment the service begins with the bidding given by the very Reverend David Ison, who is the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. We come to this cathedral today to remember before God Margaret Hilda Thatcher, to give thanks for her life and work, and to commend her into God's hands. We recall with great gratitude her leadership of this nation, her courage, her steadfastness, and her resolve to accomplish what she believed to be right for the common good. We remember the values by which she lived, the ideals she embraced, her dignity, her diligence, her courtesy, and her personal concern for the well-being of individuals. And as we remember, so we rejoice in the lifelong companionship she enjoyed with Dennis, and we pray for her family and friends, and for all who mourn her passing. We continue to pray for this nation, giving thanks for its traditions of freedom, for the rule of law, and for parliamentary democracy, remembering the part we have played in peace and conflict over many centuries and in all parts of the world, praying for all today who suffer and sorrow in sickness, poverty, oppression, or despair, that in harmony and truth we may seek to be channels of Christ's faith, hope, and compassion to all the world. Joining our prayers together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. the first of three hymns in this service chosen by Lady Thatcher, He Who Would Valiant Be.
after those stirring words by John Bunyan, the music by Ray Fawn Williams, the first lesson from the King James's Bible from Ephesians, read by Amanda Thatcher. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amanda Thatcher, Lady Thatcher's granddaughter, and now the anthem, Hear My Prayer, O Lord, the music by Henry Purcell. And this is taken from Psalm 102. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The anthem that follows was chosen by Lady Thatcher for the service at her husband's funeral, Sir Dennis Thatcher. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. The music by Brahms, the words from Psalm 84.
Now follows the address, which is given by a friend of the Thatcher family and of Lady Thatcher, the Bishop of London, the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Richard Charles. After the storm of a life lived in the heat of political controversy, there is a great calm. The storm of conflicting opinions centres on the Mrs. Thatcher, who became a symbolic figure, even an ism. But today, the remains of the real Margaret Hilda Thatcher are here at her funeral service. Lying here, she is one of us, subject to the common destiny of all human beings. There is an important place for debating policies and legacy, for assessing the impact of political decisions on the everyday lives of individuals and communities. Parliament held a frank debate last week, but here and today is neither the time nor the place. This, at Lady Thatcher's personal request, is a funeral service, not a memorial service with the customary eulogies. And at such a time, the parson should not aspire to the judgments which are proper to the politician. Instead, this is a place for ordinary human compassion of the kind that is reconciling it is also the place for the simple truths which transcend political debate and above all it is the place for hope. But it must be very difficult for those members of her family and those closely associated with her to recognize the wife, the mother and the grandmother in the mythological figure. Our hearts go out to Mark and Carol and to their families and also to those who cared for Lady Thatcher with such devotion, especially in her later years. One thing that everyone has noted is the courtesy and personal kindness which she showed to those who worked for her as well as her capacity to reach out to the young and often also to those who were not, in the world's eyes, important. The letter from a young boy early on in her time as Prime Minister is a typical example. Nine-year-old David wrote to say, Last night, when we were saying prayers, my daddy said everyone has done wrong things except Jesus. And I said, I don't think you have done bad things, because you are the Prime Minister. Am I right, or is my daddy? <laughs> now, perhaps the most remarkable thing is that the Prime Minister replied in her own hand, in a very straightforward letter, which took the question seriously. And she said, however good we try to be, we can never be as kind, gentle, and wise as Jesus. There will be times when we do or say something we wish we hadn't done and we shall be sorry and try not to do it again. She was always reaching out. She was trying to help in characteristically uncoded terms. I was once sitting next to her at some city function and in the midst of describing how Hayek's road to serfdom had influenced her thinking, she suddenly grasped my wrist and said very emphatically, don't touch the duck pate, Bishop. <laughs> it's very fattening. <laughs> she, she described her own religious upbringing in a lecture she gave in a nearby church of St. Lawrence Jury. She said, we often went to church twice on a Sunday, as well as on other occasions during the week. We were taught there always to make up our own minds and never take the easy way of following the crowd. Her upbringing, of course, was in Methodism, to which this country owes a huge debt. When it was time to challenge the political and economic status quo in 19th century Britain, it was so often 
The Methodists who took the lead. Tolpuddle martyrs, for example, were led not by proto-Marxists, but by Methodist lay preachers. Today's first lesson describes the struggle with the principalities and powers, and perseverance in struggle and the courage to be were characteristic of Margaret Thatcher. In a setting like this, in the presence of the leaders of the nations and many representatives of nations and countries throughout the world, it's easy to forget the immense hurdles she had to climb. Beginning in the upper floors of her father's grocer's shop in Grantham, through Oxford as a scientist and later as part of the team that invented Mr. Whippy ice cream, she embarked upon a political career. By the time she entered Parliament in 1959, she was part of a cohort of only 4% of women in the House of Commons. She had experienced many rebuffs along the way, often on the short list for candidates, only to be disqualified by prejudice against a woman, and worse, a woman with children. But she applied herself to her work with formidable energy and passion, and continued to reflect on how faith and politics related to one another. In the Lawrence Jury lecture, she said that Christianity offers no easy solutions to political and economic issues. It teaches us that we cannot achieve a compassionate society simply by passing new laws and appointing more staff to administer them. She was very aware that there are prior dispositions which are needed to make market economics and democratic institutions function well. The habits of truth-telling, mutual sympathy, and the capacity to cooperate. And these decisions and dispositions are incubated and given power by our relationships. In her words, the basic ties of the family are at the heart of our society and are the nursery of civic virtue. Such moral and spiritual capital is accumulated over many generations but can be easily eroded. Life is a struggle to make the right choices and to achieve liberation from dependence, whether material or psychological. And this genuine independence is the essential precondition for living in an other-centered way, beyond ourselves. The word Margaret Thatcher used at St. Lawrence Jury was interdependence. She referred to the Christian doctrine that we are all members one of another, expressed in the concept of the church on earth as the body of Christ. And from this we learn our interdependence. And as she said, the great truth that we do not achieve happiness or salvation in isolation from each other, but as members of society. Her later remark about there being no such thing as society has been misunderstood and refers in her mind to some impersonal entity to which we are tempted to surrender our independence. It's entirely right that in the Dean's bidding there was a reference to the lifelong companionship she enjoyed with Dennis. As we all know, the manner of her leaving office was traumatic, but the loss of Dennis was a grievous blow indeed. And then there was a struggle with increasing debility from which she has now been liberated. The natural cycle leads inevitably to decay, but the dominant note of any Christian funeral service, after the sorrow and after the memories, is hope. It's almost as perplexing to identify the real me in life as it is in death. The atoms that make up our bodies are changing all the time through wear and tear, eating and drinking. 
We are atomically distinct from what we were when we were young. What unites Margaret Roberts of Grantham with Baroness Thatcher of Kesteven? What constitutes her identity? The complex pattern of memories, aspirations and actions which make up a character were carried for a time by the atoms of her body, but we believe they are also stored up in the cloud of God's being. In faithful relationships, when two people live together, they grow around one another. The one becomes a part of the other. We're given the freedom to be ourselves and as human beings to be drawn freely into an ever closer relationship with the divine nature. Everything which has turned to love in our lives will be stored up in the memory of God. First there is the struggle for freedom and independence and then there is the self-giving and the acceptance of interdependence. In the Gospel passage read by the Prime Minister, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And that I am is the voice of divine being. Jesus Christ doesn't bring information or mere advice, but embodies the reality of divine love. God so loved the world that he was generous. He didn't intervene from the outside. He gave himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ and became one of us. What, in the end, makes our lives seem valuable? After the storm and the stress have passed away and there is a great calm. The questions most frequently asked at such a time concern us all. How loving have I been? How faithful in personal relationships? Have I discovered joy within myself? Or am I still looking for it in externals, outside myself? Margaret Thatcher had a sense of this, which she expressed in her address to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, when she said, I leave you with the earnest hope that may we all come nearer to that other country whose ways are ways of gentleness and all her paths are peace. T.S. Eliot in the poem quoted in this service sheet says, the communication of the dead is tongued with fire beyond the language of the living. In this Easter season, death is revealed not as a full stop, but as the way into another dimension of life. As Eliot puts it, what we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. The address by the Bishop of London, and now one of Lady Thatcher's favorite films, the Nethro hymns, the him Love Divine or Love's Excelling, written by Charles Wesley.
There follow Lantos prayers Curry. read by a minor canon chaplain, Sarah Einstein, Rose Hudson Wilkin, the speaker's chaplain, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Liverpool, the American Man Church that is representative, born of a and woman the president of the Methodist Conference. Man that has a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succor, but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins art justly displeased. Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful ears to our prayer, but spare us, Lord most holy. O God most mighty, O holy and merciful Saviour, Thou most worthy Judge eternal, suffer us not at our last hour for any pains of death to fall from Thee. Like as a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto them that fear him. For he knoweth whereof we are made. He remembereth that we are but dust. The days of man are but as grass. For he flourisheth as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goeth over it, it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endureth forever and ever upon them that fear him and his righteousness upon children's children. O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him as our hope is that our sister doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, Receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Heavenly Father, who in thy Son Jesus Christ has given us a true faith and a sure hope, help us, we pray thee, to live as those who believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting, and strengthen this faith and hope in us all the days of our life, through the love of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Saviour. 
Amen. Now the anthem from Fores Requiem in Paradisium Deducant Te Angeli. May angels lead you into paradise. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, from henceforth blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Even so, saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labours. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Last hymn, I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, with the music by Gustav Holst.
Go forth upon thy journey from this world, O Christian soul. Go in the name of God the Father Almighty who created thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, his Son, who suffered for thee. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who strengtheneth thee. Aided by angels and archangels, and all the armies of the heavenly host, may thy portion this day be in peace, and thy dwelling place in the heavenly Jerusalem. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life. Until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and for ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, with you this day and always. Amen. And so after the blessing the bearer party comes back up the aisle and will process once again with the coffin down the aisle and out of the west door and in that procession the insignia will be borne to this time not by the two granddaughters of Lady Thatcher but by members of the cathedral staff And once this coffin is borne on their shoulders, the choir will sing the recessional, the Nunc Dimittis, with music by Charles Stanford, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace.
The bells of St. Paul's, still half muffled, ring Stedman Sinks. As the coffin comes out of the west door. down the steps after pausing briefly on the platform there between the two sets of steps. At the top of the steps, Sir Mark Thatcher and Carol Thatcher, the son and daughter of Lady Thatcher, and behind her two grandchildren. Her Majesty the Queen came down the aisle with the Duke of Edinburgh, but is waiting behind as the family lines up to watch the coffin being placed back in the hearse for its journey to the Royal Hospital Chelsea watched by these Chelsea pensioners 16 of them in line on either side there of London and the Archbishop of Canterbury and Her Majesty the Queen just inside the west door watching as the coffin is placed in the hearse. funeral is now over as the hearse drives from here down to Chelsea to the Royal Hospital. The family who've heard a powerful lesson from 
the Bishop of London about their mother and her virtues and merits and making distinctions between the person and the politics. The Order of Merit and the Garter are placed with the coffin. The motto of the Queen's, of uh, Lady Thatcher's Garter, incidentally, is two words printed on the front of the funeral service, Cherish Freedom. Having arrived here by gun carriage, the coffin is driven away in the hearse, down the route it, uh, it came. We'll just watch it as it goes back down Ludgate Hill, towards Ludgate Circus and then away to Chelsea. Lord Mayor of London on the right there, escorting the Queen down the steps in his flamboyant robes. The City of London very jealous about this being their part of the city. And that's their privilege to welcome the Sovereign when she comes here. Originally, of course, a sign that the Sovereign wasn't allowed into the City of London unless the merchants of London wanted him. Then, like at any family funeral, conversation with the guests, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh talking to the Thatcher family. And watching all that with me here has been Peter Hennessy, a professor of contemporary history. It's a big contemporary event. And we've been joined by Nick Robinson, BBC's political editor. And as we're watching these pictures, what would you say, Peter, about the event? It brings out the gift we have as a country for rites of passage, the ceremony, the choreography of these occasions, and the poetry of the words and the music. We do seem to have, a, without wanting to sound self-congratulatory, we do seem to be naturals when it comes to this. And it is a great rite of passage, this where everyone stood as an individual on Mrs. Thatcher and her ism. This is an extraordinary event. And in a strange way, she now passes into the hands of historians. Dr. Johnson once said, the fame which had once spanned the world ends up in cloisters and quadrangles. And it's intriguing to speculate how the long view of history will regard her. But on one thing I'm certain, she'll be there. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh get into their limousine, flying the Royal Standard, and they'll be on their way. And Nick Robinson, how well do you think this whole morning of the ceremonial and then the service has managed to bridge that gap between Lady Thatcher, the woman who the family were talking about and the bishop was talking about, and Lady Thatcher, the political activist who arouses such a confusion of opinion with many people very hostile to what's the very thing that's been happening here. Well, I had a sense that the Bishop of London in his sermon above all wanted to do that, didn't he? He talked about the gap between the mythological figure, the figure of the ism, Thatcherism, and Margaret Hilda Thatcher, the real Margaret Hilda Thatcher, as he said. And he said at times that it would be difficult for her family to recognize the wife, the mother, the grandmother in the mythological figure. But he was a little more political than that, David. He didn't just remind us with some nice stories about the, the young boy who'd written a letter to her at Downing Street that she'd replied to, that she was once a scientist who worked on developing Mr. Whippy's ice cream. But he also 
went back over the words, one of the most controversial phrases she'd ever used, there's no such thing as society, and said they'd been misunderstood, quoted another speech that she'd given, and tried to explain you know, in terms of Christian thinking that it was, first and foremost, individuals that counted. Sir Mark Thatcher and his wife and the rest of the family. Take their leave and behind in the cathedral still that great gathering of politicians and soldiers, the, the great and the powerful and then among them the two New Zealand women who looked after Lady Thatcher in her final years, Crawfy, her great close friend who was with her for a long, long time and really more intimate with her perhaps than anybody who's talked a bit about her and the jokes she made but really clearly knows what Lady Thatcher was like in those years. Cynthia Crawford is there in the center with the black hat, the person to her right pointing something out, Cynthia Crawford who had told a wonderful story about late, late one evening, Baroness Thatcher, Lady Thatcher said to her, um, you better have a drink, she said, I have a gin and tonic, she said, no dear, you can't drink a gin and tonic at this time of night, you have to drink whiskey and soda, very insistent. That was the moment that made suddenly the service laugh, wasn't it? When the Bishop of London told a similar story about how she'd taken his arm at some reception, said, don't have the duck pate. It's very fattening. And everybody could hear in that. The there, very in the, there in the centre, Lord Carrington, who was her foreign secretary at the time of the Falklands and who resigned over the Argentinian invasion of the Falklands. One of the great and one of the last truly honourable resignations and his memory goes back to Winston Churchill, right through the spectrum of Conservative Prime Ministers. David Steele and David Owen, the people who formed the alliance of Liberals and Social Democrats that's emerged now as the Liberal Democrats. Sir Bernard Ingham there, leaning forward with the red hair. Sir Bernard Ingham was a staunch, stout defender of her, still is vociferous, angry, often spirited Yorkshireman. Who puts up with no nonsense from anybody. When Do you he... have any runs, run ins with <laughs> him? I didn't tell you, but when uh, you, we correspondents used to say Downing Street says what we meant was Sir Bernard, and he was a louder echo of and, Margaret Thatcher. And Charles Pohl, a close advisor there on the left, sitting next to the Duchess of York, Fergie, if I'm not mistaken. Can't mistake that hair. Charles Paul, of course, one of an extraordinary pairing, because his brother then went on to be Tony Blair's chief of staff. He was foreign affairs advisor uh, to Margaret Thatcher. And Charles said she was a dreadnought amongst a fishing fleet last week. Did you hear that? Yes. yes Very good. Yes. I thought the most powerful image, David, that we've seen, though, is this extraordinary image of the monarch watching the coffin of a politician, if I may say a mere politician, as it were in British constitutional terms, being taken away. There was all this debate about whether it was a state funeral. Mm. It wasn't. It was a ceremonial funeral. But it was an extraordinary sight to see just behind us on the steps of St Paul's, the monarch waiting. Boris Johnson there sitting next to Michael Howard. Uh, yes, of course, it's a, it is interesting in that way. It's also a, a celebration of a politician by politicians. I mean, it was they, it was the political class who chose to have this service. It was they, not just the present administration, but uh, Gordon Brown, who agreed to the gun carriage, and before that, Tony Blair, who had all the arrangements across his desk. So, in a way, quite difficult for them. I mean, what do you make? They, every ambassador loves an ambassador, every politician loves a politician. <laughs> you know, they, they, they wanted, they wanted politics to be seen as a, as a through Mrs. Thatcher's life 
as a noble calling, whatever you thought of the, of the policies. That's really what this has been about. I think it's a recognition that everybody feels that you changed the jet stream of British politics. It will never return to the pre-1979 configurations and patterns, and I think they all recognise that. There's Norman Lamont in the middle there, uh, I think, yes, who was Chancellor, her Chancellor of the Exchequer. Major's Chancellor, John Major's Chancellor. John Major's Chancellor, John Major's Chancellor yes, yes. yes. Dame Shirley Bassey, one of the many distinguished guests, the very recognizable figure of Jeremy Clarkson on the left there, who I think is uh, very sympathetic to her political point of view. Simon Weston from the Welsh Guards. Welsh Guards played a very big part here today, not only with Garrison Sergeant Major Bill Mott, uh, his brother, and also all the route liners that were formed from the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards, and the, uh, and the Guard of Honour here. So a last word about this. Just in a historical context, Peter? Well, I think one thing we can be sure of, more of Margaret Thatcher, her way of doing politics, her personality, will cling to the Velcro of our collective national memory than any politician of recent times. I think we're very unlikely to ever see in our lifetimes an event of this sort. We may never see an event of this sort for a politician in this way. Clearly, the exact nature of the funeral divided, and yet the essential uh, somberness of the occasion came through, didn't it? The muffled bells, and to see the Chancellor wipe away a tear from his cheek at one the point. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Chancellor of the Exchequer yes. appeared to. Now, we all know if we've lost a loved one, we can't be sure whether the tear was for Mrs. Thatcher or some personal memory that any one of us could have uh, in a service of that sort. But it was striking, David, that it happened. But one note against that. The cheers from the crowd here, again and again they cheered, they broke into applause, is if they wanted to say, after all this contention and debate, we're here to cheer you on your last journey. I talked to them, and they're her friends and admirers here at St Paul's. Anyway, thank you both very much for coming in and watching it, and our other guests who are here. It was, um, it was the leader of the opposition, Ed Miliband, speaking in the House of Commons, who described Lady Thatcher as a, as a towering figure. And it's perhaps that one word that best explains this ceremonial funeral we've seen today. Politicians of many parties, despite their political differences, have come here to honour what they consider to be, and the public accepts, is a towering political figure. One who still inspires mixed emotions, but who, as Britain's first woman Prime Minister, dominated the political scene and was admired for that from around the world. President Obama played tribute to the way that she'd made, in his words, made Britain, shown Britain how to be at her best. And it's the politician rather than the policies that have been commemorated here, very much so. The policies will be the subject of controversy for many years to come, as all political policies are. But no one, I think, will forget the woman who, with single-minded determination, won three elections in a row to impose her will on this country for over a decade. From St Paul's Cathedral, good afternoon.